Welcome to the One God Report podcast. This is podcast number 112 called John the Baptist Came from Heaven. To come from above or to come from heaven or to come from God, are these to be understood as literally coming from heaven to earth or figuratively, meaning to be authorized and empowered by God? In podcast number 37, an interview with Kermit Zarley called I Came Down from Heaven, we discussed this figure of speech already, focusing on John chapter 6, where Jesus said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And there too, we saw that Jesus was speaking figuratively as his flesh is the bread and his flesh did not literally come down from heaven. And it's in the Gospel of John, we are told specifically that Jesus used figures of speech that often his listeners didn't understand, and specifically, often those who opposed him didn't understand. They were taking the figures literally and therefore not understanding what Jesus was saying. In this podcast, I want to basically read a blog post by Troy Salinger, where he exegetes John chapter 3, verse 31 to 36, we'll focus in on up to verse 34, where the author of the Gospel of John talks about somebody who comes down from above. I think Salinger does a good job explaining this text. So I asked him if I could just read it here on the One God Report podcast. The audio format can be easier and more accessible for those maybe driving or taking a walk rather than reading. Of course, we've heard from Troy before on the One God Report podcast on the so-called pre-incarnate appearances of the Son of God in the Old Testament. Just note as I read through some of Salinger's blog post, he'll use the name Yeshua for Jesus, and he'll use the word ontology, a word that means having to do with the nature. Is the ontology, the being, the nature of Jesus different from John the Baptist or from other human beings? So be aware of that word ontology. Let me read John chapter 3, verse 31 to 36. Quote, The one who comes from above is superior to all. The one who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks about earthly things. The one who comes from heaven is superior to all. He testifies about what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. The one who has accepted his testimony has confirmed clearly that God is truthful. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for he does not give the Spirit sparingly. Traditionally, this passage has been taken as the continued testimony of John the Baptizer, which began in verse 27 of the same chapter. But more recent scholarship has seen verses 31 to 36 as the comment of the gospel's author. I'll just interject here. I believe that is correct. This is an editorial comment by the author of the Gospel of John. Salinger continues, Typically, the passage is interpreted as a contrast between Yeshua, the one coming from above, and John the baptizer, the one from the earth. It is traditionally understood that this speaks of the ontology of these two figures, Yeshua being divine in nature having literally come from heaven to earth, and John, the baptizer, being simply of human nature, having his origin on earth. Sometimes the contrast with Yeshua is expanded to include all of the Hebrew prophets before John. In this view, the witness of the baptizer and of the other prophets is seen as somehow subpar or limited in some sense in comparison to that of Yeshua's. Admittedly, this interpretation does appear consistent with the flow of thought of the immediate context. In verses 27 to 30, the baptizer testifies that Yeshua has the greater role to play and that he must become greater while he himself must become less. Then verse 31, in the traditional view, contrasts Yeshua and the baptizer and all the prophets in some commentaries, asserting Yeshua's superiority to John. Verses 32 to 34 then tell why Yeshua's testimony is superior to John's. But as we shall see, this interpretation is not without its problems, 
as it contradicts not only other statements in both the Hebrew Scriptures and the New Testament, but also other statements in the Gospel of John itself. This has seemed to escape the notice of those commentators who take the traditional view, which is nearly all of them. My Proposed Interpretation One prominent theme of this Gospel is whose testimony should be believed, that of John the Baptist and Yeshua, or that of the Jewish leaders. This is why I have said before that I believe this gospel was written primarily to Jews of the dispersion and only secondarily to Gentiles. The author's purpose was to show the Jews living outside of the land of Israel why they should accept Yeshua as the chosen king even though the Jerusalem leadership had rejected him. One's testimony should be received or rejected based on whether their authority to speak was from God or from men. This can be seen in passages which fall into three categories. First, John the Baptist's authority and testimony. Secondly, Yeshua's authority and testimony. And then thirdly, the Jewish leadership's authority and testimony. In contrast, that of John and Jesus. We might also add a fourth category, which stands over the other three, that's God's own testimony. I propose that John 3, 31-36, should be understood in light of this prominent theme, and that all three of these categories are present in the passage. The whole passage seems to be about who has the right to speak for God in an authoritative way and hence why one testimony should be believed over another. I see this not as a contrast between Yeshua and John the Baptist, but as a contrast between Yeshua and John the Baptist on one side and the Jewish leadership on the other side, since the testimonies of Yeshua and John the Baptist were congruent against the testimony of the Jewish leaders. Now an exegesis of the text. Critical to the traditional interpretation is the necessity to take the phrases comes from above, comes from heaven, and from the earth in the most literal sense. The traditional interpretation conceives of an ontological difference between Yeshua and John the Baptist, and so these phrases are taken literally. That is, Yeshua has actually come from heaven or from above, and John and the prophets are literally from the earth. This means that Yeshua's ontology is divine, and John the Baptist is human. While the text could be saying this, it seems to me that the presupposition that Yeshua is a divine being must precede that conclusion. Why would anyone suppose that Yeshua, who is clearly portrayed in this gospel as a human being, literally came from heaven, unless they presupposed he was something other than merely human. But generally, we don't think that human beings had some kind of existence in heaven before becoming a human person. There is circularity to the traditional interpretation. It goes like this. We accept that Yeshua is portrayed in this text as literally coming down from heaven because we know he is a divine being. And we know he is a divine being because the text says he literally came from heaven. But what if the phrase comes from above or comes from heaven is meant to be taken figuratively? It could then apply to mere human beings. And this is what I think the text is actually saying. In my proposal, the phrase applies to John the Baptist as well as to Yeshua. And we can even include all the Hebrew prophets. Is there any evidence that this could be taken in a figurative sense? Did John the Baptist come from heaven? It is highly probable that the words above and heaven are simply being used as a metonym for God, as another way to say God, as in chapter 3, verse 27, 8, 23, and 19, 11. It is interesting that the figure in chapter 3, 27 occurs just four verses before our passage begins. John the Baptist said in 3, 27, No one can receive anything except what is given him from heaven. Could John the Baptist's use of the figure have been the impetus for the author's use of it here? If this is indeed the use of metonyms in verse 31, 
then the two phrases simply mean comes from God. But what does it mean to come from God? Couldn't this still leave open the possibility that the one who comes from God literally comes from heaven? Such an idea is completely unnecessary to make sense of the passage. In verses 1 and 2 of the same chapter, we read this, quote, Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him, unquote. In expressing their belief that Yeshua had come from God, does anyone seriously believe that Nicodemus and other members of the Sanhedrin thought that Yeshua literally came from heaven? The very idea is absurd. What they meant was that they recognized that God had raised him up and commissioned him to publicly declare God's word, and the signs he performed confirmed that God was with him. But this language would apply just as equally to John the Baptist and to all the former prophets as well as to the Messiah. Further evidences that the phrases comes from above or comes from heaven are to be taken figuratively is that the passage goes on to explicate their meaning in verse 34. Quote, For the one whom God has sent, unquote. Hence, to come from above or come from heaven means to come from God, which means to be sent by God. But doesn't being sent by God still leave open the possibility that the one sent by God must have literally been sent from heaven? Only if one presupposes the specific individual in mind to be a divine being, otherwise no. In fact, we have an example in this very gospel of one who is sent by God whom no one imagines came literally from heaven. John 1, 6, quote, A man came sent from God whose name was John, unquote. Furthermore, all the Hebrew prophets are said to have been sent by God. See Salinger's article for references. While the phrases come from above, come from heaven, and sent from God could imply that the one in question literally came from heaven, such as when God sent an angel for some purpose, there's nothing inherent in these phrases that demands they be understood that way. In the case of angels, we know that they have their origin in heaven and come from there when sent by God. But such is not the case with human beings. So again, the main reason why most commentators take these phrases literally when the subject is Yeshua is because they already think he existed in heaven as a divine being before becoming a man. Let's explore this figurative use further in the Gospel of John. In chapter 8, verse 23, Yeshua, in a wrangle with the Pharisees, see verse 13, said, You are from below, I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. Unquote. This is an example of Hebrew parallelism where a thought is expressed one way and then repeated in another way. Here, to be of this world is equivalent to being from below, and to be not of this world is equivalent to being from above. This also enables us to see that the thought of being from above is to be understood figuratively. Though one could take the phrase, not of this world, in the most literal sense to understand Yeshua to be saying that he had his origin in another world instead of on earth, we should be cautious, in light of what we have already seen, to jump to that conclusion. In chapter 17, verses 14 to 16, Yeshua uses this phrase again, not only about himself, but also about his disciples. Praying to the Father, Jesus says, quote, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Unquote. If the phrase can be easily applied to those who are regarded by all to have had their origin on this earth, 
even as it is applied to Yeshua, then there's no reason to take it literally or to speak of one's ontology. Rather, we are free to take it figuratively, to speak most likely of one's allegiance. One can be said to be of the world when their allegiance is toward someone or the man-made systems of the world, whether religious or political, that are in opposition to God and his truth. Conversely, one can said to be not of this world when their allegiance is toward God and his truth and in opposition to the man-made systems of this world. With this understanding, we can interpret chapter 8, verse 23, something like this. Quote, You Pharisees have your commission from men. I have been sent by God. Your allegiance is to man's traditions. My allegiance is to God's truth. If we look outside of this gospel, we can find even more evidences that the phrases come from above, come from heaven, are to be taken figuratively. There is an account recorded in all three synoptic gospels in which the religious authorities question Yeshua as to who gave him authority to do the things he was doing. Yeshua turned the tables on them and asked them a question. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? Now, when Yeshua said the baptism of John, he really in effect means John himself, for John's activity cannot be thought of separately from himself. Yeshua's question amounts to this. Who commissioned John to do what he did, God or man? So we see the same idiom that we find in John 3.31 used here of John the Baptist. But what of the phrase, the one being from the earth is from the earth and speaks from the earth? Taking the former phrase in the figurative sense to mean from God, we should understand the phrase from the earth figuratively to mean from man. The whole phrase could mean something like this, quote, The one who is sent from man is taught of man and speaks the words of man, unquote. If this is what the author means, and I think it is, then we should not think that this refers to John the Baptist or to any of the Hebrew prophets before him. In the context of the gospel as a whole, it can only refer to the religious leaders who were opposed to to the ministries of both John the Baptist and Yeshua. To be from the earth corresponds to being from below, in chapter 8, verse 23, and from men, in the three synoptic passages regarding the baptism of John. Therefore, all of this evidence taken together should suffice to convince any unbiased mind that John 3.31 could apply to John the Baptist as well as Yeshua meaning John the Baptist came from heaven. Now, someone may object to this interpretation based on the fact that the text says, quote, the one coming from above, the one coming from heaven, or the one who is from the earth. Does this preclude the idea that these phrases could refer to more than one person, namely only to Yeshua? Absolutely not. For the grammar of the passage certainly allows for these phrases to be referencing more than one person. This Greek construction of a masculine singular present participle preceded by the definite article, which is quite common in this gospel, can denote either a single person or a type or a category of persons. In the second class, it refers to anyone who is performing the action of the verb. For example, in John 6:47. The one believing means anyone who believes. Or in 657, the one feeding on me means anyone who feeds on me. In 718, the one speaking for himself means anyone who speaks for himself. And in 1245, the one looking at me means anyone who looks at me. So in our study passage, the one coming from above or from heaven means anyone who comes from above or from heaven. And the one being from the earth means anyone who is from the earth. This means that the phrase, the one coming from above, need not be understood as referring to Yeshua alone, but also to others who, like John the Baptist, fit the category. 
The testimonies of Yeshua and John the Baptist are sometimes spoken of together as of the same quality and against the religious leaders. Earlier in chapter 3, in his conversation with Nicodemus, Yeshua said, I tell you the truth, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people do not accept our testimony. Who was Yeshua referring to when he said we? Perhaps his disciples? I don't think at this early point in Yeshua's ministry that this could be said of his disciples. The more reasonable conclusion is that he was referring to John the Baptist, in which case he seems to put their testimonies on the same level. Another passage in this gospel that seems to imply that the testimonies of John and Yeshua are qualitatively equal, but which is often obscured by inadequate English translation, is chapter 5, verses 31 to 37. Here is a typical English translation. If I testify about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who testifies in my favor, and I know that his testimony about me is true. You have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. Not that I accept human testimony, but I mention it that you may be saved. John was a lamp that burned and gave light, and you chose for a time to enjoy his light. I have testimony weightier than that of John, for the works that the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I am doing, testify that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. Any astute student of Scripture should immediately see some problems with a face value reading of this translation that was the NIV. For example, is it really true that if Yeshua testifies about himself, his testimony is not true? Such a conclusion is obviously wrong. If Yeshua testified about himself that he is the Messiah, would that testimony not be true? And what about verse 34? Does Yeshua really not accept testimony from human beings? The very thought is absurd. Did he not send out his apostles to do that very thing, to testify about him? Another problem is who is being referred to in verse 32. That's when Jesus said, there is another who testifies in my favor. Most commentators say the Father, but is that the best way to take it? I will say first that verse 32 is better understood to be referring to John the Baptist, not the Father. As I will show, it seems to me that Yeshua is showing a progression in the testimony about himself, from the least persuasive to the most persuasive. This has nothing to do with the content value of the testimony in each case, or the ontology of the one testifying, but of the persuasive value in each case. In verse 31, Yeshua, talking to the Jewish leaders, admits that his testimony about himself would not be valid that is, in their eyes, because anyone can assert something about himself. This is the least persuasive testimony. He then says in verse 32 that there is someone who testifies concerning him and his testimony is valid. This is John the Baptist, as verse 33 confirms. The Baptist's testimony is more valid than Yeshua's because it is always more persuasive if, after asserting something about yourself, Someone else, especially someone recognized as a prophet of God, confirms your self-testimony. Verse 33 refers back to chapter 1, verses 19 to 28. That's the testimony of John the Baptist. Verse 34 should read, The testimony I receive from John is not from man. This is a better way to take the words. For the reason already given above, but also because if John the Baptist's ministry was not from men, as seen in the synoptic passages already noted, then why should we think his testimony was from man? From man here obviously means of human origin, as it does in Matthew 21:25, and has nothing to do with the ontology of one testifying. Yeshua is actually confirming that John's testimony was from God, not from himself. If it was from God, why should we think that it was deficient in some way simply because it was delivered by a human being? 
Verse 35 speaks further of John the Baptist, calling him a lamp who gave light to Israel for a time. This language certainly implies that God was at work in the ministry of John the Baptist and that his testimony about Yeshua was just what God raised him up to declare. Then in verse 36, Yeshua says that he has a testimony that is greater than John's. The NIV gives the right sense with the word weightier, for this testimony is greater only in the sense that it was more compelling than John the Baptist. So John's testimony was more persuasive than Yeshua's own testimony, but still more compelling was the very works that Yeshua was doing, which the Father had given him to do. This can only refer to the miraculous signs and wonders that Yeshua performed, which was, in fact, God giving testimony that he had sent Yeshua. See Acts 2.22. So this passage is further evidence that John's testimony should not be regarded as from the earth, but from above. Turning back to our passage in chapter 3, let's see if the remainder of what is said about the one coming from above can apply to John, and for that matter, to all the former prophets. First, the one who is from above, that is, from God, is said to be above all. Those who take this to refer to Yeshua alone understand the phrase to speak of Yeshua's authority over all others as the Lord from heaven. But in what sense could John and all the prophets be said to be above all? The word all need not be taken in the most literal sense, but only of all within a certain category, that is, those who publicly speak a message. In this context, it would refer to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, the religious leaders. The one who has been commissioned by God to speak on God's behalf has a higher authority than those who are taught in the traditions of men and are authorized by men to speak. If the two should have contradictory testimonies, then the one sent from God should be believed over the one authorized by men. We can know that above all should be understood like this, rather than in a lordship sense, because of what immediately follows in verse 32. It says, He testifies to what he has seen and heard. Unquote. This shows that above all is associated with the testimony of the one coming from heaven, not to a superior ontology. So let's look at verse 32. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, and yet no one receives his testimony. Can this be said of John and the prophets? The typical interpretation, which attributes this to Yeshua alone, takes this as saying that Yeshua testified to what he had seen and heard while in heaven, prior to his incarnation. While this could be a plausible way to take the text, if one already presupposes Yeshua to have pre-existed as a divine being, it suffers from at least two problems. First, I am not aware of anywhere in this gospel where Yeshua is portrayed as actually speaking about things he had seen and heard while in heaven as a divine being. Second, we have an explicit statement of Yeshua in this gospel telling the Jewish leaders just in what sense they should understand him to have received his message. In chapter 8, verse 40, Yeshua says that he is, quote, a man who has told you the truth I heard from God, unquote. Notice how this statement is without ambiguity. It's clear and not open to more than one interpretation. Now, compare it to other statements, either of Yeshua or the author of the Gospel, which seem, on the surface anyway, to say that Yeshua literally came from heaven. Are not these kinds of declarations ambiguous? Are they not open to figurative interpretations? But it can't be both ways. Either Yeshua was telling the Israelites of the things he had personal knowledge of because he had personally lived in heaven as a divine being, or he was a man who was telling the Israelites the truth he heard, that is, which he had learned, from God, just like Moses and all the prophets after him. 
John the Baptist is clearly portrayed in this gospel as testifying to what he had seen and heard. He heard God tell him, quote, The man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Unquote. John saw the Spirit descend upon Yeshua at his baptism, and so he testified. The same can be said for all the prophets before John. They testified to what they had seen and heard. The primary means through which God communicated his word to the prophets was by visions and dreams. They saw things in the Spirit and heard God tell them what to speak to the people. In Jeremiah 23, God is rebuking false prophets and in doing so reveals something about the true prophets in verse 18. Quote, but which of them, of these false prophets, has stood in the counsel of Yahweh to see and to hear his word? Who has listened and heard his word? Unquote. So the prophets were said to have, as it were, stood in the counsel of God, where they would both see and hear God's word. They then testified to the people what they had seen and heard. Back to John chapter 3. The last clause of verse 32, quote, but no one accepts his testimony, unquote, is also true both of John the Baptist and the prophets. The phrase is evidently hyperbolic, as verse 33 shows, and means that many did not accept his testimony, especially the Jewish leaders. This has always been true of all who were sent by God to proclaim his word. Verse 34 states, that whoever is sent by God speaks the words of God. Surely no one would seriously argue that this can only apply to Yeshua. When John the baptizer saw Yeshua passing by and proclaimed, quote, Look, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Was he speaking from his own mind, or was he speaking the word of God? We have already seen that the baptizer was indeed a man sent from God, and, as such, must have spoken the words of God. But this is also true of all the Hebrew prophets, who, being sent from God, spoke the word of God to the people. We will consider next the final clause of verse 34, quote, For he gives the Spirit without measure. Unquote. Was Yeshua given the Spirit of God without measure, while John the baptizer and the prophets were given only a portion of the Spirit? This is the prevalent idea, but the problem is that it is derived solely from this verse, and the verse is just too ambiguous to be certain of its meaning. The Greek reads simply, For not out of measure he gives the Spirit. The word for points to the reason for the preceding statement. That is, the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God because he gives the Spirit without measure. If my proposal is correct, how then would the statement be understood? Although the clause has a subject, a verb, and a direct object, something seems incomplete about it. Some versions add the words to him to make it more intelligible, which, along with the addition of the word God, results in, quote, for God gives the Spirit to him without measure. It is from this uncertain translation of this verse alone that the idea comes that Yeshua was given the Spirit in a fuller degree than the prophets. There is no other verse that I am aware of that states such an idea. So, if we understand the passage as, God gives the Spirit to him without measure, then we must say that it would not refer only to Yeshua, for as I have already shown, all of this language is just as easily applicable to John the baptizer and the prophets, as it is to Yeshua. So then, the verse would be saying that God gives the Spirit without measure to those whom he sends, who speak his words. Though it is not clear exactly what without measure would mean, this may be expressing a similar sentiment as 2 Peter 1, 20-21. Quote, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For the prophecy never had its origin in human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as though they were carried along by the Spirit. 
unquote. Whenever we do see the Spirit being given to the prophets in the Hebrew Scriptures, we never read that the Spirit was given to them in some limited sense. In fact, Luke's Gospel says that John the Baptizer was filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. There's no good reason to think that Yeshua of Nazareth was endued with the Holy Spirit in any greater way than were the former prophets. I think that for Trinitarians who see Yeshua as a divine person, it becomes necessary to have him set apart from all merely human prophets, since in their thinking, Yeshua is ontologically superior. Salinger has a nice summary of his article. I'll just highlight a few points. First, we need to understand the metaphorical language, especially in the Gospel of John. It was particularly those who were in opposition to Jesus who took the metaphorical language literally. So let's get those metaphors correct. The idioms to come from above, to come from God, to come from heaven, are synonymous figures of speech. And they all mean basically the same thing. And that means to be commissioned by God, inspired by God, to be authorized by God, to be empowered by God, to be participating as a spokesman, witness for God in God's work. Just like in any language, we need to understand the metaphors. If we don't understand these Hebraic metaphors, then we get lost. If I tell somebody that knows nothing about baseball, I say, that guy stole second base. Well, should we call the police? If he stole second base, we need to understand the metaphors in the Bible. Likewise, to be from below or of the world or of the earth is the opposite from being from God, from above. To be from below means to be simply of human origin, not speaking for God. Like Jesus said, the apostles were not of this world just like Jesus was not of this world. So being not of this world doesn't mean you came from heaven or from some other planet. And this section of scripture in John chapter 3, verse 31 to 36, is an editorial comment by the author himself, in which he is contrasting the testimony of both Jesus and John the baptizer on one side against the testimony of the religious leaders of Jerusalem on the other side. Jesus came from heaven, from above, or from God. Likewise, John the Baptist was from God, from heaven, commissioned, initiated, empowered, authorized by God, as compared to the religious leadership whose testimony was simply of this world, from below, not initiated, not commissioned, not authorized by God. The Gospel of John's readers, they're to understand that the testimony of John the Baptizer and Jesus was true from heaven, from above, from God, as opposed to the rejection of the Messiah by the religious leadership in Jerusalem. And one other point, I might encourage people to take a look at the book of Jeremiah, chapter 23, 16 to 22, where Jeremiah describes an experience of people being able to be in the council or the secret of God. The real prophets of God saw visions and dreams as if they were in the council of God. This would be to be from above, to be from heaven. Whereas the false prophets, they were not privileged to be in the council of God. They spoke from themselves falsely. We today, especially Gentiles, we don't understand the process in which God communicated to the prophets. But these metaphors, to be from heaven, to be from above, are describing that process in which God communicated to prophets, and especially to Jesus. As Jesus said, he is a man who is telling the truth that he heard from God. So thanks, Troy Salinger, for the good work here and for allowing me to present this on the One God Report podcast. Check out his blog. He's got lots of other good articles. Yishma'u anavim